What's up, Dream Builder? Welcome back to another episode. And I'm excited today to be sharing with you guys the man, the famous Mr. Joshua Alufa. How are you, my man? I'm good. I'm good. I don't know about famous, but I, I, I'm like I'm like Kevin Hart famous. That's what Kevin Hart likes to say. I'm Kevin Hart famous. Like yeah. in the restaurant. I'm that guy from that thing. But no, nah, I appreciate being here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely, my brother. And the reason why I say famous is because it's crazy how I found out about you. I think it was Instagram. And then instantly you follow me over to TikTok. And then I was just seeing the content everywhere. So that's the reason why I say famous, man. I see your content everywhere. And I think you've been doing oh, yeah, some dope sure. things in the trading community and the financial literacy community. And we definitely going to tap into those today. Uh, so the first thing that I, I always like to do is I like to learn a little bit more about the backstory, right? Cause we're going to talk options. We're going to talk financial literacy, but I like to learn the backstory because I think of everybody as superheroes, right? And we all are a superhero within our own right. And so for you, for somebody who's never seen you before, they're looking at you as a Superman after the, after you tell a lot of your story, but a lot of the times they don't know the backstory of who's that man behind the scenes. Right. And I like to say the Clark Kent. So tell us in your upbringing, like, for now where you are, it looks amazing. But in the backstory, like, where did it all start? Well, that's a great question. So if you know a little bit about me, I started off, I went to school. My parents um, always, you know, stress good grades. I'm Nigerian. So those who know Nigerian and Nigerian parents, you know how that story goes. I remember telling uh, somebody about, I went to my mom after high school. She said, son, what do you want to study in college? I said, mom, my dream is to be a chef. Uh, she almost slapped me upside my head. She said, in this family, you have three choices, doctor, lawyer, or engineer. Those, those are my three choices. And I said, but I, I love cooking. And then she said, what did I tell you, son? Doctor, lawyer, engineer. But I ended up being an ER nurse, actually. So my, my parents still teach me, like, you didn't even get the doctor part, part right. You ended up being a nurse. So that's kind of my uh, backstory. I did nursing for several years. I was in the ER um, and long-term care facility. So I, I served as a nurse, saving lives, helping people. So I always just had that heart to kind of serve people. Um, but I always remember my first check as in the ER, I think after working, you know, all those hours, 12 hour shifts, I would make like 1280, you know, after two weeks of work. Now, yeah, you're saying 1280 a week, like, no, like, every, like, two weeks, like two weeks, $1,280, not a week. That was gotcha. me. That was my bi-weekly paycheck. It was $1,280, give or take. And just come around full circle. It's so crazy. Now, I literally did a video two months ago where I made twelve eighty in five minutes. So for me, that was, I still have those moments. Just seeing that twelve eighty number triggered me emotionally. I was like, wow. I remember when it used to take me two weeks of work, 12-hour shifts, um, doing nursing, saving lives to make the same amount of money. Wow. So, okay, let's, let's back this up a little bit. Did you, where did you grow up? I mean, did you grow up in Nigeria? Did you grow up in the States? Where did you grow up? So I'm a hybrid American. Okay. So what I mean by that is that I, I grew up in America. I've been here for 20 years, but my early years were in Nigeria. So I came here when I was seven years old. So my original education, my original language was all Nigeria. I learned Yoruba. I learned um, the British way of schooling, which is what's taught in Nigeria. Um, in 1997, I believe it was, 1998, my parents came here to America. Um, and then that's when I started English. And of course, my American career began as an American citizen. But I live in both worlds. I'm actually one of those people who are bilingual. I speak my native language and I also speak English fluently. So I relate to both sides. That's what's up. So early on, I mean, because it sounds like you always kind of you always were somebody who was looking to go out. You were going to serve other people. You were going to help other people. Were you all, were you an entrepreneur early on or did you start out and you were like, nah, I am going to kind of follow the path. I never thought that I'd, you know, become an entrepreneur one day. No, I didn't. I was going to be an entrepreneur one day. Funny enough. So my whole heart was just service and ministry. Even at my church, I was actually became even the youth pastor for my church. So I always thought down the line, I would actually go into ministry, like full-time ministry, travel the world, preach the gospel, that whole thing. Um, but then I was like, making money, not making money sucks. I need a way to make money. Um, my dad, when he came to this country, he drove a cab, okay? And that's how he supported me and my family. And then 
about five years after he came to this country, he started flipping houses to real estate. My mom, though, was a nurse as well. So in my house, I had both sides of the story. I, I saw both sides. Um, but my dad just never involved me in the entrepreneurship side. So when I needed more money, I just said, okay, where do I turn? I need to start a business. I need to do something that's going to bring money. And working extra hours just wasn't going to be that for me. Gosh. And so why not? If you've seen that, hey, dad started off as a cab driver, right? And you, you kind of already went down the path of your mom, right? Being an ER nurse. So then you see your dad started off as a cab driver. Then he becomes an entrepreneur. Now he gets into real estate. And so for you, I guess, even as a cab driver, you're kind of an entrepreneur. So for you, why didn't you go down the path of real estate? Or did you try your hand at real estate in the beginning? No, I did try my hand in real estate a little bit in the beginning. I did a little bit of real estate. But the thing about my dad is, I don't know whether it's something about being Nigerian or just the culture. Like, even though my dad had some money, we didn't know we had money. I'll give you an example. In high school, I actually won an award. I was... Um, I don't know whether you've heard of who's who in America, like of high school students. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I won the award. I was recognized as the top 10 percent in the country. And they had a trip internationally to go to Spain for advanced training. I asked my parents for the money to do that. And then the response to me was, well, we don't have money for that. I later found out literally three years ago, talking to my mom recently, that at that time we had twenty, thirty thousand dollars in savings or they could have sent me. So even though my dad had some money, the mindset was still he didn't have the financial literacy. Right? Mm -hmm. So he learned real estate step by he had a friend that showed him real estate. Like, well if you want to make money, this is how you flip. This is the how to's. But it, it never came with the financial literacy of this is how to multiply money. This is how to keep your money moving. And what ended up happening is all the money my dad made flipping, he lost it all. Wow. He lost what, it all. From what? And said what? From what? How did he lose it all? So he invested in things that necessarily, looking back at it, it didn't make sense. I'll give you an example. And I've actually never been transparent like this before. So this is this is this is very interesting. Um, my mom told me that he invested in a Photoshop, like you know, taking pictures in Nigeria, where people will walk into the building, they will pay a certain amount of money, and then they'll get their passport photos taken, something like that. Yeah. Well, this was before cameras, iPhones, social media. So when that whole came around, that whole business just got destroyed. Worked out. Yeah. Worked out in like a blink of an eye. And then he took all his profits. I think it was about $200,000 in cash. All of his savings from working, flipping for 10 years. That was pretty much his retirement. And he invested it to set up that business. Because obviously camera equipment can be expensive studio space stuff like that so that's what my mom that was my mom's idea of entrepreneurship and she was like no my kids you guys are going to be safe go on become a nurse a doctor a lawyer an engineer gosh gotcha. and so let me ask did you think that knowing that y your dad had money but he did did that give you any type of uh, resentment or did it fuel your fire to say, listen, it's not about the money for me, but I'm going to figure out early on how to make my money work for me. So if my kids do come to me and they want to do something like travel abroad, I got to be able to support them. Like, was that a fuel or were you just like, nah, like that's just the way that it goes. I know funny. Honestly, for me, I was, I was pissed. I was bad because you have to remember this is back in 2005, 2007. Uh -huh. Right. If my dad would have put that money in the S&P 500 in stocks, if they had put it in Facebook, in Twitter, in whatever, my life would be drastically different than it is now. Right. So it's that feeling of a missed opportunity. But as I grew older, I learned to appreciate the things he did do for me and kind of see the positive side of that, which means now I know what not to do when I get money. Now I know how to approach things differently, right? Now I know what to focus on um, when I'm doing that. Don't get into any investments that, like first secure your, your legacy, your future before you start doing alternative investments and buying like Bitcoin. Like, it, it, listen, I'm against Bitcoin, guys. We can have a whole debate about it. I can tell you why. I don't know whether we have the time for that for this episode, but to me, that's another thing where I'm like, it's not producing cash flow. If you're going to, like for me, my rule with that is 5% or 10% of 
my income can go to speculative investments that's where bitcoin comes in for me so i know that's a random but yeah i had mixed emotions about it but i just took the positive out of it and then tried to help like let that guide like what i do now and lessons did i did i learn and moves that i make now with my money yeah for sure and i'm sure you might ruffle some fa actually I, I would say there's a lot of people out there that's probably gonna agree with you though to say yo bitcoin you know but i think a lot of it is just becoming educated on it i am i'm more on your side right with bitcoin but i think that there is a lot in the DeFi space that allow you to actually create passive income or cash flow and then put that money into something like bitcoin ethereum something that doesn't pay you on a daily basis right that you're not getting those dividends from so that is another conversation conversation that we could have. Uh, but to keep it on your story. So now you said you tried your hand at real estate. So talk yeah. to me, but like, what was the things that you did in real estate? And, and why do you why do you feel like real estate wasn't for you? So wholesaling, um, I did like mini flips, I, I almost did everything. Um, I did private notes, creative financing. So I actually invested in a 25k program from Rich Dad Poor Dad. That was the beginning of my entrepreneurship journey because obviously if I want to start something, why as well start with real estate. Right. Um, and then we were doing pretty well at it. Actually, I was getting um, you know, five figure checks, you know, but one thing for me is that the time between investment to profit was so long that it didn't fit my lifestyle. It didn't fit what I was trying to do. And also, when the market changes in real estate, you have to be you have to be able to pivot with that change and create a new strategy to keep your business running. It's just like any business, obviously. So for me, I kept doing real estate while searching for a new way to make money that was more instantaneous. And oh. that's how I came into stocks. The very first book I read was Penny Stocks for Dummies, my one of those dummy books. And then I watched a webinar by this guy, Tim Sykes. He actually has a book called um, um, The Underground Hedge Fund, something something like that. Shout and out to Tim. So we've had Tim on the show. Oh, you have? Okay, perfect. We have, yeah. yeah. So he was my first introduction into, into um, stocks and stuff like that. So I read his book watched his webinar, got one of his programs. I invested in so many programs to learn options and stocks. And I was like, this is crazy. You're going to find out whether you're right or wrong within minutes if you do it right. You don't have to wait months. The ROI is like, boom, right there. And, you know, being the ER, that fast-paced type of adrenaline, that's what I like. So I was like, yeah, bring it on. That fit my personality type the most. Gosh, no, that that's super dope. So... When you first got started, now we're talking about your introduction in stocks. Did when you first got started, were you thinking of yourself as a long-term investor? As in, did you like, hey, I'm gonna buy Apple, I'm gonna buy Tesla, and I'm gonna wait it out for you know a couple of years, and then I'm gonna sell off? Or did you always get it? Did you get from the beginning into options and, and whatnot? Great question. So I've went through the whole wheel. So I started off as a value investor, and I still consider myself a value investor. A uh, value investor For means people, that... Yeah, I was going to say, what is value investor? So a value investor, are those are your Warren Buffetts of the world, your Richard Pryors, you know. Um, those people who find a stock that might be worth 80 bucks, but it drops to 20, so you're pretty much buying the dip, right? But there's some math, so you're just not buying any dip. You're buying great companies that have great cash flow, great returns, uh, low debt, great management, and a great moat, okay? Moat is our competitive advantage. Okay, those mm -hmm. are the four criteria you look for. When you find something like that on discount, you buy it and then you hold it. For example, 2020, the market crashed, right? Facebook, Apple, Amazon, all these companies went on discount. If you bought it low then, your portfolio has doubled in two, three years, right? Just mm -hmm. from holding those. So that's value investing, um, which was good, okay? I still value invest. My long-term portfolio is value investing. But I wanted cash flow, things I could use to make money in minutes and hours, right? And that's how I transitioned into first penny stocks. Okay, I started trading penny stocks. Then I went into options, trading options. Gotcha. And what was, so 
what was the thing? Like, who was it still Tim Sykes that was like, hey, this might be a better option for you? Or as you're starting to learn, how did you say, hey, this is, was it more about you just understanding what your lifestyle was? Or did you find a mentor that says, hey, why do you do value investing? Let me show you a, a faster way for you to be able to make money in, in options and stocks. Yeah, so it was, a, it was the latter. So I was doing value investing and the money was good. But mind you, at this point, I was still working as a nurse and I wanted to quit my job. So for me, I'm looking for something that can bring more consistent cash flow on a more regular basis. So options, trading stocks was one of the ways. And then options became a derivative of that that I kind of pivoted into afterwards because the leverage of options is so much crazier. I tell people, like, why do you even trade stocks? It doesn't it doesn't make sense. Uh, so that's how I got into options trading from that uh, from that mindset. So the coaching programs I bought, um, I don't know whether you've ever heard of Rule One by Phil Town. Uh-uh. Okay, great resource. You can get his books. He teaches value investing and options trading. So believe it or not, Warren Buffett is actually one of the biggest options traders in the world. People don't know that. He talks about safe bets and buying the index funds. If you actually look at his holdings, he makes, in 2020, he made $7.1 billion in options trading. Wow. Exactly. But these are the things that the advisors, they can't readily give out because it's not blanket advice, right? So when these people speak in public, like when you're Warren Buffett, you know, you're Tony Robbins, you know, people who are giving financial advice, they have to make blanket statements that can help majority of people and keep you safe, okay? But that might not be the best and most rewarding option for you, okay? Mm. But if you were to get into a room with Warren Buffett when he's talking to his closest friends, I promise you options is, is, a, is a conversation you're talking about in that room. So let me ask you something. How long have you been trading options? So I've been trading options since 2018. So how long? So four years now. Four years, four years, yes. But I've been trading okay. stocks since 2016. So I've been doing it for a long time, studying the gotcha. market. Yeah. What's the most money you've made in one day in trading options? 50 grand in one day. How many hours was that? Um, I would say it was about an hour and a half. An hour and a half. It was Netflix. An I had a hour huge, and a half, you made yeah. 50 grand off trading Netflix. Yes, but I had a huge size in it too, though. You have to remember that. I did put Break about- Break down the play. Do you remember the play? So it was 25K. Earnings season was coming up for Netflix. Right. So the night before I put 25K into Netflix, I woke up the next morning. I let it ride the market for like an hour and a half and I took profits. So you doubled your money. Yeah. Right? Was that 20? Was that 50K oh, profit? 50K, so you came out. 50K profit. So it ended up being 75K. 75K. So I closed now, it out. Yes. So I talk to me about what'd you say? Funny enough, so people who join our community, there's actually a video of us like on a Zoom call together making that money and people of us like literally crying when that money was being made in real time. Remind me, I'll send you that video. It's a, it's a funny Yeah, video. we yeah. definitely want to see it. So talk to me about out of all of the plays, you, are you somebody, if somebody, there's so much unpacked right here. So for somebody who's never done options trading, when, when they think about it, are you teaching people that they should find one stock and then just figure out how to trade that one stock? Or is it like, no, you need to have, you know, seven or eight stocks in your arsenal because certain times is not like, what does that look like? So the worst advice somebody trading can give you is to trade seven, eight, 10, 50 stocks at the same time. Worst thing you can do, you're going to lose money that way. Okay. Get one to three stocks that you focus on. They become your side boost, okay? And you know those stocks inside and out. And when you trade them, you can trade them with consistency. I mean, think about it. If you watch a particular stock over a five-year, 10-year span, right? Let's just say, over time, you're going to begin to master it to a point where you can begin to predict how the stock moves, especially intraday, right? So it's about mastery. So you find one stock, SPX is where we recommend. You master how it moves and you trade it every single day. Got it. So the advantage of this is it doesn't matter because talk to me, you said 
one of the things that I heard you say is in real estate, if the market corrects, right, or, or changes, then you got to pivot, you got to find a new strategy. Now, what about when the stock market, like right now, depending on when somebody's watching or listening at this, this is in November of 2022. And right now, the market has been on the downward trend, right, overall over these last, you know, three to six months. So mm -hmm. do, have you had to, to find a different strategy and pivot the same way that someone would in real estate? No, that's why you make the most money when stocks are going down okay. <laughs> when you're trading. Break yeah. that down then. Okay, so if you think about it this way, there's this saying in finance, right? When stocks are going up, they take the staircase. When they're going down, they take the escalator. And the reason is when people buy stocks, hedge funds, let's say you're buying Apple at 100 bucks, And let's say you say, I'm only willing to lose 20 bucks. So you will put a stop or a get out at 80 bucks, right? You following? Yep. So you brought in at 100. You don't want to lose more than 20. So you put a stop at 80 bucks, right? Right. So let's say it starts going down. Imagine millions of people stops being triggered and selling at the same time. So it creates a cascade effect and the stock starts going down faster. So you make your money faster when trading. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so no, that's, I, I... that's how it works. Now, for somebody who's brand new to, to stock options and they say, okay, I get it, but it seems like there's always a, a barrier, like when you talk about making a 50K in an hour and a half, right? But you had to put in 25,000. So for somebody that's like, okay, but listen, all I got is $500 right now. For that person, they're looking, okay, if I get into options, like how much, well, first off, let's just ask the questions. How much do you recommend that somebody has in their trading account for them to get started? Is 500 enough or should they be saving up until they get 5,000, 10,000? What does that look like? I would say if you have 2K, about 2K, you're, you're, you're good to start. That's a good starting place. So you can actually do paper trading where you can practice your trades with fake money and actually trade in the real market till you feel comfortable before hopping into your real money with your real money. It's called paper trading, right? But it's all about the education, right? You have to get the knowledge. And things are always a mystery until they get revealed, okay? What do I mean by that? Real estate is something that's really big now. Everybody's talking about real estate, multifamily. Like rich dad ex exposed multifamily to the masses, right? But before that, most people didn't have that information, so they thought real, real estate was risky. But real estate is actually one of the most safe and secure investments you can make. Same yeah. thing with options. It's a revolution where people now people are now becoming aware to it, right? At least the basics of it. And the more you know and the more you find out, the more you can actually use it to your advantage. So I see options trading as a tool that every American should have, especially if you're a business owner or entrepreneur. I don't see it as... Oh, if I wanted to start a business, should I start options trading? I'm like, no. Whether you're a carpenter, you're a marketer, you're a content creator, you better know how to do options. You better know how to trade. It's going to become that essential because, I mean, you have insurance, I'm assuming, right? You, you have insurance yeah. on your house or your yeah. car? Yep. Yeah. All of the well, above. Options is insurance on your money. Mm, break that down. Okay. Very simple play. And I, you can do this whether you decide to to become an options guru or not. So I'm gonna give you a scenario, okay? You have house insurance and car insurance, right? What's the purpose of house insurance? Uh, if, in case something goes wrong, right? Okay, in case your house catches on fire, right? Right. And what's the purpose of car insurance? In case you crash your car, or in case somebody else runs into you, in case your car is total damaged. Okay, great. So let's use your car, for example. Let's say your car catches on fire um, and you don't have insurance, how long do you think it'll take you to go and buy a new car? Probably, what, two, three years for the average person. Okay, great. So... Are you talking about paying for it in cash or... Yeah, no, you're right. That's fine. Two to three years for the average person. So let me get this right, okay? You work 30 to 40 years putting a nest egg in the stock market, but you don't have insurance for it. Mm. And well, then, what if somebody... But what if somebody says, okay, I get it. Well, we're putting this nest egg and I think for the average business owner, but what if somebody says, well, listen, I'm not in the stock market at all yet. Right. And, and I'm thinking about getting into the stock market, but I only got $500 to invest in anything. Like is options still a good option? Yeah. So options is a good option to start learning and then build your way up. I would say put a little bit at a time. So you have about a thousand to 2000. The reason I came up with that example is that even if you're working a regular nine to five, you have a 401k 
And in 30 to 40 years, your 401k is going to be $500,000 or a million, three million. But what if the market goes down, you lose your whole retirement, and then you have to go back to work at Walmart? Nothing wrong with working at Walmart. There's an options contract called a put, okay? P-U-T. Like I'm putting you in jail, okay? You can buy a put to actually secure your cash and your stock positions. So in case the market goes down, it actually provides insurance for your money. Mm. So even if you decide options not for me, you should at least be doing that. You should at least be insuring your money. That's your retirement. And that's why for me, options is a necessary skill for you to learn to make money. It should be part of financial literacy, but nobody really teaches it. Yeah. No, that's, that's a great, great way to put it. I love that. And I think for anybody who is in the stock market already, they definitely are like, oh, well, I, I think I need to learn this. Because just like you said, if you have, you know, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, putting insurance on that money in case the stock market was to go down, which we know you can't control the stock market. You can't control these companies. You can't control, you know, if the government's going to keep printing out money or interest rates, any of those things. So it helps you to provide that insurance. But let me, let me ask for somebody that says, okay, I get it, but to everything there's pros, but then there's also cons, right? Yeah. So within that stock market, like what are the downsides of, of being in options, right? Cause there's something for everybody. When should I say that options might be a more riskier play for me as opposed to being a value investor? Great question. So options is risky if you're not willing to lose the money you put in. So with options, just like with stocks, when you buy a contract, the most you can lose is what you put in. So even if you have 500 bucks, let's say you buy a contract in Apple, the most you're gonna lose is that 500 bucks. But if you're not willing to lose your money, obviously it's, it's gonna be risky for you. But what I tell people is the same thing with anything, like just buy stocks or starting a business, is about getting the education on how to mitigate that risk that's important, mm -hmm. right? So what options actually does is that it's actually leverage. I don't know whether we covered this. So options is leverage. So if I wanted to control 100 shares of Apple right now, I would need $50,000, give or take, to buy 100 shares of Apple. You can control that same 100 shares with like $600. Break that contract. down. Okay, great. Let me go a little bit deeper. So it's a contract written. You're in real estate. You probably hear some of these real estate terms. Have you ever heard of wholesaling before? Yeah, absolutely. You're tying down the property with a contract? Right. That's what options is. You're literally tying down the hundred shares of Apple with a contract and you're putting down a down payment on it, earnest money deposit, 500 bucks. Now, if the value of that stock rises, even if it's just two to $3, the value of your down payment actually goes up. So you can actually sell that contract that you bought for $500 down payment. You can sell it for $1,000 down payment, but instead of waiting weeks, months, or years, you can do it in minutes. Mm. So uh, that's pretty much how options work. Got you, got you. So yeah, man, that, there's so much, so much to uncover there. So for you, I guess, where do you continuously get more of your information? Is once you've been in for four years now, are you just using the market as your learning experience? Are you you still having to invest into higher coaches? Like, how do you learn more advanced strategies, techniques, things like this? Once you was like, hey, I've been in for a while, I understand options. How do I grow now? There's always growth potential. So I'm always constantly investing in mentors and I'm also being in the market daily. So I'm getting that real time, real time experience, but you always have to invest in your education. Always. I buy courses like crazy, whether it's three bucks or $50,000, I'm buying it so I can invest in my knowledge because options trading is a skill. The better you get, the return becomes exponential. Gotcha. Now, one of the things that I know a lot of that freaks a lot of people out when it comes to the stock market, whether it's options mm -hmm. or whatever, but it's understanding charts, right? As they call it, TA, tech analysis, right? Yeah, uh, analysis, yeah. Yeah. So talk to me about like when it comes to understanding charts and candles, like how much of that is a part of understanding the market? Like, is it just, hey, I got to I got to know these couple stocks and what, you know, their their news is because there's a lot of ways when you say cover a couple, you want to do one to three stocks, let's say, right? One to three companies that you understand you've been watching them for six months, a year, whatever it is. But is that just, hey, I'm, I got news alerts on these companies? Is it that I got to know their earnings calls? Or is it none of that stuff even matters? Just look at how it's moving on the chart every single day. Yeah. So when you're day trading, you're getting in and out within minutes. You don't need a whole bunch of background information, right? 
as long as nothing major cat uh, catastrophically is happening with the company you can just go into the market and trade it like i don't remember the last time i checked news i'm gonna be perfectly honest with you and i make anywhere from 500 to 1500 dollars a day trading options so i'm just looking at the chart and if it moved like that yesterday and the day before most likely it's gonna move the same way today right so you just take trades based on what you've seen historically. And gotcha. technical analysis is a fancy word for pattern recognition. I'll give you an example. So I teach my students this. Do you know how to recognize a square? Yeah. Hey, great. What if I took that square and I put it in between a lot of circles? Would you still find the square? Absolutely. That's what technical analysis is. You have to look for a setup, that square. You have to be able to identify it, where it shows up over and over and over again. And when you see that square, you take the trade. When you don't see that square, you don't take the trade. Mm, that's a simple way to put it. Yeah, I know. I, I absolutely love that pattern recognition. I'm glad that you broke that down. So for most people to start seeing results in options trading, right? Because it's going to take some time, as you said, especially if you're new to this game. Where, with your students, right, and anybody who's really investing in themselves, how soon do you see that people normally start getting positive results on this? I'd imagine every day for you. Let's let's look at your days, um, or you could you could break down your students' days. On average, how many days of the week are they profitable once they pick one to three stocks? Like, is it four days? Is it three days? That's a good question. I never thought about it like that. I like to measure by month because you can have like a bad two days or a bad four days, but with option trading is risk to reward ratio. I'll give you an example. Um, I'll give you an example of one of my students' weeks last week, and then I can give mine as well. So she made $300 on Monday. She made 460 on Tuesday. She made $1,500 on Wednesday. She made 700 on Thursday, and then 850 on Friday. That's a 5K week or 6K week, give or, give or take. So she's profitable with 6K that week. The next Monday, she lost 200. On Tuesday, she made 1800. On Wednesday, she lost 150. On Thursday, she made 500. And on Friday, she made 600. So you ha you'll have losing days. It's all about mitigating your losses and letting your, your runners kind of grow. That's kind of how options trading works, right? So as long as you're overall profitable every two weeks, every four months, then you're good. Gotcha. Okay. And what about you when you say yours? Because you also said like when you made that 50K day, you also started out with 25,000. Yeah. So for you, like, what does it look like if you would be willing to share? What does it look like now as far as your trading account? And, and also another thing is, because it sounds a lot like uh, online poker to me, which is something I did for two years where you have a bankroll and you want to stay within a percentage of that bankroll every single day. Right. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to get out of your bankroll. You want to stay disciplined. So for you, do you teach your students to and even yourself? Do you use one to two percent? Is it more like five to ten once you get a little bit more advanced? What does that look like? So 10 to 15 percent of your trading account is what I usually recommend trading with. OK, but there's this principle that we teach called scaling in. OK, and the more you have consistency, the better and easier this is, this is to do. I'll give you an example. I'll give you the example of a square. If you see a square and you know that you, that you know that it's a square, you've been doing it for such a long time. A lot of times, I will scale in heavier size, so I'll put in fifty percent of my of my account size in that one trade, right? But I'll do it for a short period of time, maybe one to three minutes, and then I'm getting out and I've made three to four k that day. Hmm. Because how often? So how often are you doing? Because it sounds like that I'm might be like a... two to three day, two to three days a week. If I see the opportunity, I'm attacking it. So I can't time when that opportunity will come. But once I see it, you have to jump on it. Because with options, you're not getting paid for your time. You're getting paid for the opportunity. Mm. So whenever the opportunity presents itself, you have to take action. Gotcha. Okay. And it's by, again, pattern recognition. Correct. You pattern recognition. You're like, oh, this is coming. This is coming. There's one sign. There's two signs. Here's the third sign. You got to jump on the opportunity. Exactly. So imagine how easy it is to recognize those patterns if you've been watching the same stock for three to six months. Right. Facts. Imagine how hard it would be if you're watching eight to ten stocks. Right. Absolutely. And right. that's where most people go wrong. They're watching too many things. One to two. That's all you need. Gotcha. So talk to me about where do most people where do most people lose at then? 
Is it just because they're not disciplined? Is it because they, they recognize in the wrong patterns? Where do you see most students go wrong of why they get out of option trading? So uh, I say option trading is an emotional sport mm -hmm. because you're always controlling greed and fear. At, at the same time. So let's say you're having a winning week. You're crushing it this week. I had a student who called me. He was crushing it that particular month. He was up 30 grand that month, okay? New student. He's only been trading for seven, eight months, right? And then he called me one day, like, defeated. I was like, what happened? He was like, well, I just lost 15 grand today. I was like, how did you lose 15 grand in one day? How's that possible? He was like, Josh, I was trying to go for like a 100K day. I was like, oh my goodness. When you're in a way. Exactly. That's the thing. When you're in profit, and I should tell my students, when you're crushing it, you have to start becoming more and more conservative. Mm. Because your grief starts getting to a place where you're like, oh, I'm crushing it. You feel invincible. There's a euphoria there. But right. then you forget that if you're not careful, the market will teach you a lesson. And I've learned those lessons myself. Right? I tell my students, Make your money and leave the market alone. You don't need to mess with it. Get your little couple hundred to thousand dollars a day and just leave. That's it. Right. And it's that greed piece that actually gets a lot of people caught up. Man. Yo, that that's so crazy. I just picture it. That he was like, yo, we going big and we going home. And then he went home and he had to call you. He was like, I'm at home. I know. It's it's and, and those kind of phone calls I'm sad to hear because I'm I mean, imagine so this particular person, you know they probably make, let's just say, for example, 10K a month. They didn't even make that, right? They're trading options. They make like 30K that month in profit. This is profits, right? right. And their account is not big. They had like a $10,000 account. They grew it to like 35K. And I was like, okay, what were you looking for? Like, what were you trying to get out of the market that made you go so heavy that you blew that? And then as the, the money was going down, why didn't you take profits? Why didn't you cut it up? Why did you let it go all the way down to 15,000? So right. it's, it's the emotional piece. Like I tell people, I can teach you how to trade options in a week. I promise you. Give me anybody that's graduated high school. I can teach you options in one week. The emotional piece is what takes you months and years to master. How to control your own fear and greed. So I tell people, you will never learn yourself more than you will trading options. Mm -hmm. You will know about yourself very intimately. No, oh, man, that's not. Let me ask you, for you, outside of options trading, uh, who's been, um, I guess, what is some of the, the biggest books or podcasts that you listen to outside of the financial market? For somebody that's like, listen, I want to start this journey of wisdom, right? Which is what I hear out of you, uh, every single word. It's more about wisdom. And you started to tell them with your dad and, and everything that you went through in your early childhood. Where are the places that you go for pure wisdom? Wow, that's a great question. I've never asked that before. Well, I, I read books, right? Here's some books I recommend. Um, have you heard of The Greatest Man in Babylon? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good book to read. Um, Millionaire Fast Lane by MJ, MJ DeMarco. DeMarco. Great book. You've read that one too? I, mm -hmm. I love that book. Um, F You Money by Dan Locke. Have you read that one? Yeah. yeah. Great book. Also, oh, you're a reader too. I like that. Um, Podcasts. This one is a great one. I listen to a lot of your episodes, so I 100% recommend um, Dream Nation. Another podcast on YouTube, My First Million. Have you ever heard about that one? Um, My First Million is by Sam Barr. And... Yeah, it's by Sam Barr. And... Yeah, yep, absolutely. Why wow, like, well, you can't just do this whole podcast then? So I'm, <laughs> I'm really plugged in. But more, more than that, I invest in coaches. A lot. Last year alone, I spent four hundred thousand dollars in in coaching. Wow. Yes. So, like a lot of my money, I'm investing into myself because that's where you're going to get the greatest return. You always have to invest in you. Man, I love it. This has been a phenomenal conversation, my brother. One last question that I have that I ask everyone is: um, I used to always ask the question of if uh, if you could change anything, what would it be? And I would uh, constantly get the response, I wouldn't change anything, it made me who I am, right? And all these things, which I get. Uh, but I've learned to form this in a different way because I think that we would all change something if we could, and that's just my opinion. But I learned to ask the question now that if there was one thing that you wish that you would have implemented sooner to accelerate your path and your journey and your dream of where you are uh, today, 
what would that one thing be? Hey, that's a good question. Wow. Uh, what's that one thing? One thing. So as you probably notice in life, it's not a lot of times the biggest changes. It's the little tweaks that give you the results over time. But if I had to say one thing that would literally 10x my growth, I would invest in mentors quicker. Mm. And I started pretty early. Start investing in yourself. 18. Seriously, because... So, um, one of my uh, favorite people to listen to, Alistair Mosey, you probably know him. Yeah, yeah. He said this, and it shocked me. He said, every million dollar skill can be bought for $50,000 in today's marketplace. Mm. So, which means that you can learn from somebody who's made a million how to make a million and it's probably going to cost you 50k i wish i knew and subscribed to that principle earlier because if i'd done it earlier i would have made my first million dollars quicker i would have done a whole lot of things quicker right just by doing that by investing in myself quicker time is one of the resources that you don't get back i mean i'm 32 i wish i was where i am now at 27 28. right don't we all right time just like you said time is one of the resources our most valuable that we can't get back. Um, man, this has been, again, so many jewels, so many gems, phenomenal conversation. I wanna be the first one, if nobody else has told you yet today, my brother, to say thank you and I appreciate you. We'll make sure that we put all of the links to everything that you have going on in the show notes, but tell me, for anybody who wants to stay connected with you directly, where's the best place to reach you at? Oh, Instagram, at Josh Cashflow, for several reasons. Obviously, I post there. But I literally post my profit. So when I'm trading, I'm posting how much I made today. So it keeps everybody honest. You see what I made that day. So you see that it's a real thing I'm actually doing in real time. So that's a good place. Josh at Josh Cashflow. Um, Option Snipers, that's the name of our business. If you want to learn options trading, you can follow us, um, reach out to us. And we'll give you a link uh, that you can give people. They can sign up for our five-day uh, boot camp where we kind of teach beginners the basics. All right. That's what's up. Well, again, my brother, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an honor. It's been a pleasure. I'm sure there's a lot of people inspired right now to go learn the options game if they don't already know it or to just follow you for more of that wisdom every single day and that inspiration that comes from your Instagram, your TikTok and everywhere else. So again, thank you. And uh, remember, Dream Nation, just as he said, you got to take action on something, invest in yourself, take an action on something, because otherwise that dream that you have and we all have a dream. And without any action, it'll only merely be a fantasy. That's all for this one. We'll catch you on the next one. All right, my brother. We